It's October, and what better time of year to visit the northern reaches of Perth and Kinross. The trees are turning, the scenery is stunning, and it's the perfect time to explore the past. Noble families, Jacobites, famous regiments, the rivers and the woodlands have all contributed to the vibrant history of Highland Perthshire. The Vale of Fortingall is a fertile valley surrounded by mountains but easily accessible from both east and west by a network of lochs and glens. Archaeologists have shown us that for more than 5,000 years this area has not only been inhabited but also regarded as a sacred place. There is no evidence however for the strange but enduring tradition that this was the birthplace of Pontius Pilate. The Romans did not arrive in Scotland until around 80 AD. The Fortingall U is at the geographical heart of Scotland and is thought to be between 3,000 and 9,000 years old. It is also believed to be one of the oldest living things in Europe. In 1769, the circumference of the U's multiple trunks was measured at 52 feet, but this has vastly reduced over time, and what remains are the relics and offshoots of the original tree. Yew trees have often been the source of myths and legends. Before the arrival of Christianity, the yew was regarded as the tree of eternity. Uh, throughout Scotland there are hundreds of artificial islands uh, called Cranogs and here in Loch Tay we've got 18 of these. We came here 35 years ago, did a survey and discovered 18 sites, five of them still islands and the others completely submerged underneath the waters of the loch and uh, we've been excavating the sites underwater since 1980 and still have a long way to go. Cranogs were built by people basically as defended homesteads because the people who lived on Cranogs were relatively wealthy. They are people who were farming the shore, so they had cattle, sheep and pigs. We know they grew emmer wheat and spelt wheat. Uh, everybody thought the Romans brought spelt wheat to Scotland. Here we are 500 years earlier, the smart people living in Loch Tay, they knew about spelt wheat. And we know that because the site we excavate, because they're under the cold, peaty waters of the loch, are fantastically preserved. Excavating a, a site like a Cranock, which is so three-dimensional with the floor, timbers and everything else sticking up around you, uh, you really want to show people something like this. Um, and we decided in the early 90s that we would like to build a full-scale Cranock, which is what we did here. And we built it really as experimental archaeology to see if this freestanding structure would stand up and people could actually live on it. And uh, the other thing was uh, we wanted people to come here and see Loch Tay as a centre of Cranach studies because we still are doing research into the sites and we have a lot of work still to do. For over 19 generations, the Stuarts and Murrays of Athol have lived here at Blair Castle. In their time, there have been adventurers, politicians, Jacobites and royalists, entrepreneurs, agriculturalists, soldiers and scholars. In one way or another, this remarkable family have left their mark on Highland Perthshire. So Catherine Ramsay, who had married the 8th Duke, was Scotland's first woman MP, rather unlikely candidate as she had earlier opposed women's suffrage. She'd actually been a musician and she had got to know uh, Bardi, as he was called, Marcus of Tully Bardin, before he became the 8th Duke. So she had given up the idea of being a professional musician and had become, at that point, the wife of a soldier. He had fought in the Sudan and in the Boer War and she'd gone out to South Africa to help um, with the soldiers of the Scottish horse that were wounded. 
Uh, she'd then come back and before he became Duke, she had lived fairly quietly on the estate, not showing much signs of political activism at that point. She had written a military history of Perthshire. And then during the first war, she'd again supported him and the members of the Scottish Horse after they'd been at Gallipoli. However, after the first war, things had changed. He'd become Duke. His time was taken up on the estate and she was invited to take his place in the House of Commons. So she stood for election here in Perthshire and was elected as first woman MP for Scotland. So although the castle that you can see here is obviously the focus of the estate um, and it's where the records are kept, um, the estate was really much larger. It was um, at one point 350,000 acres, uh, it's now 140,000 acres. So you can imagine the number of people that lived and worked on that over the years. So we have quite a variety of records here, servants' records, and um, also, and perhaps more easily for people, um, tenants' records for the people that lived on the farms spread over the wider area. Um, because the tenant farmers had to pay their rent, um, we can look up and see who was there. Those go back to the early 1700s. The servants' records generally um, come in a bit later than that, some in the 18th century, and then from the mid-19th century up to the First War. There's a fairly um, good run of those. The castle has a breathtaking location and features a magnificent wall garden, a peaceful wooded grove, a ruined kirk, a red deer park and a whimsical Gothic folly. The Hercules Garden is a stunning nine-acre walled garden recently restored to its original Georgian design. Hercules himself overlooks the garden with its landscaped ponds, a Chinese bridge and an impressive orchard. Diana's Grove, a tranquil wooded area adjacent to the castle, affords a unique opportunity to enjoy some of the county's finest and tallest trees in a space of just two acres. Very near Blair Athol is the Pass of Killycranky, with the River Gary flowing at its base. This is a tranquil place which walkers and outdoor enthusiasts enjoy today. But in 1689, this gorge echoed to the sounds of shots and battle as the first major event in the Jacobite uprisings unfolded right here. We're currently standing in the, the, the Pass of Killycranky. It's very significant. It was the site of the first battle, uh, the, the major battle of the first Jacobite Rebellion on the 27th July 1689, fought between the John Graham of Claverhouse, Viking and Dundee, and the forces of the government led by Hugh Mackay. The battle itself lasts about 10 minutes. Uh, the Highlanders charge from the, the heights, they get to within 50 yards of the government troops, they, they let go a, a fairly ragged volley of musketry, throw their weapons aside, draw their swords and close with the enemy. Now, Mackay's men included a, a large number of raw green troops, no, not veterans. Um, Ken Muir's regiment in the centre breaks, Annandale, Belhaven break. The entire left of Mackay's army basically turns tail and runs without firing a shot. On the right hand side, Mackay manages to, to get some level of cohesion and his troops retreat to, to Drummond Castle. But in all, something like 2,000 men are, are, are killed uh, on the government side during, during the battle. The Highlanders lose something like 700. Uh, the problem being that includes a, a large number of the clan gentry. Uh, they tend to lead from the front, um, and perhaps the most significant loss was Dundee himself.
In Aberfeldy, there's a lasting reminder of Highland Perthshire's Jacobite history. During the uprisings, General George Wade was tasked with bringing the rebellious North under control. And in the decade after 1725, Wade's highwaymen, soldiers who were paid double for their labour, toiled to build more than 240 miles of road and some 30 bridges, including this spectacular five-arch crossing of the Tay. Wade's road-making programme was a remarkable feat of civil engineering, yet its strategic role proved unclear. Ironically, the General's fine roads merely served to advance the movements of the Jacobite forces in 1745. Another fine bridge can be seen at Dunkeld. This one was built by Thomas Telford. For nearly 200 years, ferries were used to cross the Tay here and Telford started work in 1803 with some of the funding coming from the 4th Duke of Athol. The bridge was completed in 1809 and links Dunkeld to the pretty town of Burnham. Famous children's author Beatrix Potter spent childhood holidays near Burnham and it was here she met Charles Mackintosh of Inver, a rural postman but a keen naturalist. These two very different individuals, brought together by a common interest in fungi, met and corresponded over a number of years. Encouraged in her work by Charles, Beatrix submitted a paper on her botanical research to the Linnean Society in London in 1897, but as a woman she could not present the paper herself. Despite her highly original research, the response was lukewarm, and this setback caused her to channel her energies elsewhere, the children's story she is most famous for and which have inspired the Beatrix Potter Garden in Burnham. So here we are in the Beatrix Potter Garden and it's, this was created as a legacy towards Beatrix. Uh, it's, it's an ongoing thing, we're still adding to it. And when children come here they can find all the characters that are in our stories. Peter Rabbit's here and Mr Todd's here and uh, Tiggy Winkle's here. So it, it's great for them to come and see these characters but it's also great for them to come and see the sort of environment that Beatrix would have experienced herself and be inspired by it. So when people come to the Beatrix Potter experience, they can find out all about Beatrix's life, they can find about who she befriended up here, Charles McIntosh, we've got stories on him. Also about the characters, you know, because this is initially where it all started. This is where Peter Rabbit was first drawn. This is where Tiggy Winkle was first drawn. Jeremy Fisher was mentioned here. So. We've got all that in our exhibition and we've got interactive things that the children can do. They can play in the shop, they can, they can draw, they can dress up as uh, Peter Rabbit. So it's all there for the children and it's all to inspire them. Not to look at the great character that she was, but also to, to read the books. Dunkeld itself is a charming town, and again we find the noble women of Athol in evidence here. The sixth Duchess of Athol, Anne, took an active interest in the local community and established a school for girls in 1851. The Duchess Anne School is still a community venue today. Nearby is the recently converted building which houses the community archive of Dunkeld. Volunteers run this local archive which holds the records for the Scottish Horse Regiment and they encourage visitors to find out about their ancestors. Here in the archive which was started over nearly 30 years ago by a group of local people are three main areas are the local history which includes Neil Gow who was a famous fiddler and was born in Inver. And then we also have the records of the Scottish Horse, which was the regiment started by the Marquis of Tullibarden in the Boer War and carried on through the First World War right up to the 1950s. 
but we do get a lot of people from all over the world coming to look up records of families, Australian, New Zealand, Canada especially. And with the First World War commemorations, we've had a huge amount of that. One of the main things we do here is also the graveyards. They've all been looked at and recorded, all the gravestones recorded and photographed. And this was done by Dunkeld and Burnham Historical Society. And though we don't do family history altogether, at least it's a starting point for people. And then we send them off to Perth to the AK Bell Library, who has the facilities which we don't. Pitlochry sits at the heart of Highland Perthshire. Queen Victoria loved to holiday here and from 1842 she visited many times, touring the area on horseback and by carriage. The coming of the railway in 1863 had an enormous influence on the development of the town. Wealthy tourists holidayed in style, staying in hotels or rented villas for many weeks. At the other end of the scale, hundreds of manufacturing workers from Glasgow, Edinburgh and Dundee would also descend on the town, brought by excursion trains laid on for day trips and bank holidays. Highland Perthshire can offer its visitors a unique cultural experience here at Pitlochry Festival Theatre. The story of one man's vision to create a theatre in the hills is a fascinating one and it's still possible today to stay six days and see six plays. John Stewart had visited Pitlochry um, as a child. Uh, it was already a, a tourism destination um, ever since Queen Victoria came to visit in the 19th century. So he was familiar with Pitlochry as, as a place that already had an established tourism focus. And he felt that this would be the ideal location for him to create his festival theatre for Scotland. And given that Pitlochry um, sits very much at the heart of the, the rail and road infrastructure, even though it's geographically quite remote from all the major urban centres in Scotland, this seemed to him the combination of location, the existing tourism history um, and the beautiful location to be the ideal site for the kind of facility he wanted to create. He'd hoped to have the building open by 1951 so that it was part of the Festival of Britain celebrations. But as late as 1949, he still had no way of delivering the project. He stayed overnight in Birmingham. Uh, and while he was in Birmingham, he saw a circus tent being pitched. And the idea came to him, if I can't use steel or timber or brick, perhaps I can use canvas, at least to start with. And so he commissioned the first tented theatre auditorium, um, pretty much in the UK. And it was in that form that Pitlochry Festival Theatre saw the light of day in 1951 as part of the Festival of Britain celebrations. The slogan that developed that was used as the sort of the main marketing tool for the Festival Theatre in the early years was stay six days, see six plays. By the time we get to the 1960s and 1970s, Pitlochry Festival Theatre is the only venue in the UK still producing repertoire theatre in that way. We now have a purpose-built theatre building um, that was opened in 1981. Um, this was Kenneth Ireland's big legacy to the organisation. He spent most of the 1970s um, fundraising for a purpose-built building to replace the old tented theatre with the shell around it and essentially created the next version of the festival theatre which would survive for the next 30 to 40 years. The sheer beauty of Highland Perthshire draws visitors from all over the world. The Ospreys at the Loch of the Lows Nature Reserve, Ossian's Folly in the Hermitage, the massive Douglas firs on the River Bran, and the spectacular Black Lynn waterfalls. Locals and visitors alike can enjoy the scenery, the warm welcome, and cultural highlights such as the famous Amber Festival. <laughs> 